Hello, hello, Joss here, and welcome to the second episode in this PPL vlog series. So, first of all, I want to say a massive, massive thank you to everyone who responded to the first video in the series. It was such an overwhelmingly positive response, and that, that meant absolutely everything to me, so thank you all very much. Uh, and with that response, I will definitely... <coughs> pardon me, I'm losing my voice. Uh, I'm, I'm breaking up, I'm so emotional. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll definitely continue making some vlogs. Um, as I said in that video, they're not going to be the best, they're not going to be the most fancy, glorified videos, but um, hopefully um, hopefully, I can provide some sort of value and insight as to what it takes to get a PPL, certainly in the UK at least. So, um, so this is going to be the second episode, and this episode um, revolves around one question, which is, how colorblind am I? So... Those of you who have been on my channel for a while and have been watching some of my live streams will know that I suffer from a mild form of colour blindness. Um, and it was something that I discovered at a young age. And I'll I'll take you back. I'll take you back to when the story when I discovered it. So back when I was a wee laddie in primary school at around the age of six or seven, I had to go and see the school nurse to do a couple of quick medical tests. I don't even know if school nurses are a thing anymore, but they were back in my day and all of that. Anyway, one of the tests that we did was the Ishihara plate test. So for those of you who don't know, this is a series of pictures made up of coloured dots. And within each picture, there is a number. So the examiner presents you with different pictures and you as the patient have to identify the number or numbers within the picture. Little did I know back then when I was a kid that this Ishihara test is also the primary test used by aviation authorities to test a pilot's colour vision. So the nurse presented me with the plates and I began reading the numbers. 12 3 70 2 5 as you can see, things weren't quite right. Now, while I can see the numbers that I'm reading out, they're obviously not the same numbers that someone with normal colour vision can see. So I continued through the test, and the nurse did her best to soften the blow, but she told me there and then that she thought I might have a form of colour blindness, and while it wasn't a big problem, it might stop me from doing certain jobs in the future, which require normal colour vision. Jobs like being an electrician, being a train driver, or being a pilot. Now, while I was interested in flying as a kid, I didn't fully appreciate how, quite frankly, devastating this news would be as I came towards the end of my school and education, and I had no idea what to do for a living. The only thing that had ever inspired me throughout my childhood was flying. I remember sitting in school at that young age and watching RAF tornado jets flying over my home city. As I grew up, because of the news that I received at a young age, I always had that belief that I could just never be a pilot. Ever. So, after leaving school, um, I bounced around a couple of jobs for a while and kind of stumbled into working in IT and starting an IT career and fixing computers for a living. Uh, a job which I never considered but actually suited me quite well. Um, I found it quite a challenging and engaging job. Um, that career took me to London where I bounced around a few places in London for a few years. Uh, the last couple of years working in IT were not the best. I was working for um, a horrendous narcissistic, sociopathic manager and I just, I had enough after a couple of years of working under that guy I had enough and uh, I felt like I wanted a change I, re I was really desperate for a change in something new in my life so I saw an advert to become a trainee air traffic controller with Nats, the uh, sort of the premier air traffic services provider in the UK and I thought, aha that's a good job, I like that job that job's got some serious kudos attached to it so I applied to become an air traffic controller, did a couple of rounds of online testing, passed those and got invited down to the NATS training headquarters to do some supervised computer-based testing. Did a round of that, passed it, got invited down for a fourth round of testing in total, uh, where you do a bit more computer-based testing and then uh, provided you're successful with all of that, you get invited for an interview. So I did some more testing in the morning, had an interview uh, in the afternoon. So 
as I was going through the whole application process to become an air traffic controller, I was looking at the medical requirements because I always had that nagging little doubt in the back of my head um, about my colour vision. So when I was studying for the role, uh, I discovered that the air traffic controllers are held to the same uh, colour vision standards as pilots are. Um, and yeah, I, I so desperately wanted to be an air traffic controller. I put so much time and effort into learning and studying for the role as I went through the application process. Um, and the way that their application process works is that if a candidate is successful all the way through the application, they'll give them a conditional offer to become a trainee air traffic controller on the basis that you get, you pass all the medical requirements after you've done all of the testing. So I always had that doubt in the back of my head, color vision, color vision, color vision. And um, I, I've discovered that the Ishihara test was the primary test. And I was so desperately wanting to become an air traffic controller. And I knew that that was the test that they did that and I'm ashamed to admit this, I was willing to try and cheat the Ishihara test to become an air traffic controller. As it happened, um, I think I tripped at the final hurdle. I uh, I wasn't, I kind of, I was flapping a little bit when I did the interview with a couple of existing controllers and uh, they, I, I guess I didn't fill them with confidence and I did not get an offer to become an air traffic controller in the end. So maybe that's for the best. Um, but uh, after, it was a very, very interesting process um, and I'm, I'm proud of myself that I got as far as I did in that process. Um, but uh, yeah, sadly I didn't get an offer uh, and kind of with that, that kind of was the beginning of the end of my time in London. So uh, very shortly after um, that application process, I decided that my time in London had come to an end and I moved back to Scotland. Look, I've been editing all morning, I needed to break the video up a little bit, and that was the best I could think of, okay? That, that whole nurse bit that you've just seen, I, I spent three hours animating that just now. Give me a break! So, roll on a couple more months, and I managed to secure myself a job working at my local airport. Now, I'm in an incredibly fortunate position because the company that I work for has put me into a position where studying for and training for my PPL, my private pilot's license, is a real possibility and a real opportunity. I'll explain a bit more about that in my next video. Um, so having this new opportunity, that kind of sparked or reignited my ambition to go and get my PPL. Uh, but first, I had to figure out what's going on with this color vision thing. So I didn't just launch straight into doing flight training. Um, I had to find out more about this color vision. What can I do with it? What could I not do with it? How is it going to affect me uh, becoming a pilot? So my first port of call was to reach out to a couple of AMEs or aeromedical examiners. So I emailed a couple of, of the, those uh, sort of doctors around Scotland uh, and sought their advice. I explained that I think that I might have this red-green colour deficiency and um, they both advised me to go to City University in London uh, and book myself in to do something called a CAD test, which is a new uh, kind of computer-based colour vision test. Um, so I heeded their advice, I contacted City University, got myself booked in and uh, yeah, towards the end of last year I travelled down to London to go to City University and do the test. So here is that journey. Okay, hello, hello. So just got to Inverness Airport, uh, just checked the flight on my phone just before I got there and it's been delayed already. Got a lot of visas yet. Um, so uh yeah the flight's been delayed by half an hour i think that's easy just typical we don't know what's going to happen so um yeah just about to get into the terminal just now i'll have some breakfast uh and then i'll keep you guys updated uh, so it's also going to be interesting seeing if i'm going to be able to come back um because uh, of this whole drone business happening in Gatwick. All flights in and out of Gatwick, Britain's second busiest airport, have been suspended after two drones were seen flying near the runway. I'm flying down to Luton today. Uh, police are probably wondering what I'm doing. Um, yeah, I'm flying down to 
Luton from over there, so I'm going to be flying back from Gatwick. Uh, but maybe I won't because of these drone, uh, drone pilot, drone idiots being a complete pain. So, um, yeah, I don't know how it's going to go, but uh, it's going to be quite an interesting visit to London, uh, all told. So, uh, we'll see how it goes. So 
that's me here in London now. Woo, what a journey. Right, first of all, first of all, uh, Captain Doug Naismith with EasyJet, absolute legend. If you ever fly in an EasyJet and you've got a Scottish guy called Captain Doug Naismith, just start giving the guy a, a standing ovation straight away. Um, he was a brilliant, brilliant pilot, um, really kept us up to date. Uh, he had the, the funniest uh, kind of pre-flight uh, kind of passenger briefing. Um, it was really j joking. He was, uh, had a lot of jokes. It was really funny. Um, so, uh, yeah, keep your fingers crossed that you get him if you ever fly an EasyJet because he's a fantastic, uh, fantastic pilot. Really kept us all up to date. Um, the flight was delayed in the end by about an hour. Um, and he explained why it was a medical emergency earlier on in the day, so that just knocked the schedule. Um, and uh, yeah, we ended up getting delayed again heading into Luton uh, because of some suspected uh, diverts from Gatwick, given the whole drone issue, uh, which I believe is currently ongoing. So uh, I'll need to check that on the TV in a minute. But um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, we ended up holding over uh, or just north of Luton for a little bit, so he kept us up to date on that as well. Uh, made a really good landing. Hopefully, I've got footage of it there. And uh, yeah, so so fantastic flight on the way down. And uh, yeah, got to Luton. What on earth have they done to Luton? The last time I was there, it was about gosh five, six, seven years ago. It's changed completely. Um, and I don't know if it's all for the better. Um, I maybe have a little muse around the terminal. Because uh, I might have to go there if Gatwick's still close tomorrow for my return journey. But um, what's going on with the drop-off area? Like I got to the uh, the the, uh, the shuttle bus to get to the from the terminal to the train station. I'm about to go like out. Oh, like like you've got the you've got the airport is here. This train station is down here. All you have to do is just go. Eh. But no, we kind of came out of the terminal and then went all the way around the short stay car park back onto the main road and then down to the train station. What's that all about? How can you not? How could a bus, a shuttle bus of all things, not have a, like a priority exit route? Oh, I don't get that. So I don't know. In inside the terminal, still looks like the you know some building site it has done for about a decade now. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't understand what they're doing with the whole traffic situation around there. Never mind. Just just ranting. And, see, this is it. I've come back to London and already. I'm starting to rant and rave. It's crazy. Um, apologies for not getting any uh, footage sort of out in public. I don't know why, but I'm really self-conscious about going out and like doing the whole, you know, I'm vlogging thing. So um, maybe I'll give it a go tomorrow because I want to get some footage of me being at this uh, uh, eye test research lab clinic terror thing, you know, place building. So I might try and get some footage in the wild tomorrow, but we, we shall see. Um, anyway, uh, this is my digs for the night. This is the, I think it's called the Hub um, Hotel, uh, and I think it's made by Premier Inn. In fact, you can tell it's made by Premier Inn because the room layout is the same. So it was nice and cheap. It's just around the corner from King's Cross Station. So there's my bed for the night. I have to make my own bed, unfortunately, but uh, I can live with that. Uh, but yeah, it's quite nice. We've got some electronic uh, control thingy on the uh, on the bed there. And then you've got the TV there, coat rack there, and then in the same corner as it is in every Premier Inn ever, we've got the uh, toilet and the shower there. So, quite happy with it. Anyway, I'm gonna watch a bit of TV and then I go go out and get some dinner. So, um, if I don't record anything else tonight, sorry, but uh, I'm, uh, I need to try and get an early night tonight uh, in preparation for tomorrow. Not really nervous about this whole eye testing tomorrow yet. Um, but yeah, I think once I get there, then I'll really start getting nervous. So uh, we shall see. Okay, hello there. So it's now Friday morning. Um, it's just about half past nine in the morning. So I've now got to City University, which is where I'm going to be doing the uh, the eye test. So that's what you can see uh, behind me there. So I think that's the main 
building, but I'm actually going over there to, uh, I think the site clinic's way over there, so I'm going to be heading in there in about half an hour's time uh, to begin the eye test. Not too nervous about it yet, um, but I think that once I get in there, that's when I'm really going to start getting nervous uh, and start wondering what it's going to be like. So I uh, just sat outside just now, just walked down from King's Cross, so it was about half an hour walk. It uh, wasn't too bad, although it was uphill all the way, it was kind of like, meh. Um, but uh, yeah, so I got myself some breakfast, got my favourite pret a -Manger. I love it. Um, wish they had one in Inverness actually. Get one in Inverness please. Um, so uh, yeah, so I'm just going to have a bit of breakfast quickly just now before I go in. Uh, yeah, hopefully the walk, they just got the blood flowing, will get my body working a bit better and hopefully uh, everything will go well during this eye, eye test. Um, I'm going to try and get some footage of me actually in there. Um, I will ask. Uh, it's more than likely they'll probably say no, uh, but I'll try and get a few snippets. Um, I doubt I'm going to be able to record any of the actual testing, but um, I'll go try anyway and I'll, I'll ask. What's the worst, oh, worst I can say is no. Um, so hopefully I'll get some footage of uh, me doing the testing or maybe me speaking to the consultant or um, you know the assistant, I'm not sure what the technical term would be for where I was conducting the test, um, but yeah we shall see. Uh, wish me luck. Yeah. Hi. So, this is a bit of a weird setup, but let me explain things. So, I did ask, they wouldn't let me record inside, um, but uh, there is a reason for all of this lighting and all of this weird setup. So, um, once I went in, I was met by uh, a nice, really nice guy called Ben, who uh, turned out that he was going to be my uh, assessor as well. Um, so basically, Ben took me up to one of the uh, sort of the, one of the examination rooms there at the university, uh, and we just sat down. We talked briefly about you know family history. He got me to fill out a few forms, all the usual stuff really, um, and then we began uh, doing some color vision tests. Now, the reason for the setup is that all of the tests were conducted in a darkened room with a very simple lamp like so. And uh, we ran through, I think, six different tests all, all in total. Um, now the CADS test, the, the main test that I was there for, by itself, um, can accurately diagnose a person's colour vision. Um, however, uh, I think just for, um, sort of, just to be comprehensive, uh, he wanted to do uh, several tests, including some of the more traditional testing methods that have been used so we began by doing the Ishihara test. So basically I was sat uh, at a table with a lamp and he presented me with a, a sort of a booklet which had all of the Ishihara plates. And so sort of one by one we went through the plates and I read out the numbers as I could see them. Um, he then handed me a different book, um, which I believe, um, I think, I can't remember the exact name of the test, but something like pseudochromatic uh, plate or something along those lines. Uh, it's very similar to the Ishihara. It's uh, although rather than having numbers to read, you've got little symbols hidden within the dots. So you've got like you're looking out for a cross or a circle or a triangular shape within the uh, within the dots. So uh, he presented me with a book uh, of different plates with different symbols, and I read out uh, the the symbols as I saw them. Uh, moving on from that, the next test that we did was uh, called the Farnsworth test. Uh, now this is quite an interesting one because you're given 15 little kind of almost cap type things uh, about the same size as bottle caps like this and on the top of each cap you've got a little circle which is um, a different colour. And the aim of the test is that you're actually trying to arrange the different caps into a colour gradient. So if you imagine you've got one colour and then a separate colour and all of the other caps represent a sort of a, um, a gradient um, in between those two colours and your job as the patient is to try and arrange all of the caps in a way, uh, in the correct order so that you have a smooth transition from one colour into the other. Um, now the, the thing that uh, I found interesting about this test was um, you're given a lot of freedom um, initially to sort of move the caps about and try and figure out you know, which colour goes where um, because obviously the two different ends are completely separate colours but the blending of the colours in between is where the sort of the 
uh, what really tests you. Um, and you're given a lot of, not all of the time in the world, but you're given a lot of time to uh, sort of go and figure out, you know, do those go there or should that go like that or maybe that goes like that. And then once you find uh, sort of, um, once you find an order that you're happy with, you can then place them in the storage box. However, once you place them in the storage box that the caps are stored in, your decision is kind of, you're committed to your decision at that point. You can't then go, oh, actually, no, I wanted to change that for that one. Once you kind of go in there, um, it's your decision is locked in. So, um, you know, you're given a lot of time to figure out, right, I'm definitely happy with that, or should I do that? No, I'm definitely happy with that. Right. That's my, uh, that's the order I'm putting them in. I'm kind of committed to that. So, uh, that was quite an interesting test. Um, that was good good fun, dare I say. Um, the, one of the other tests that we did was called an anomaloscope test. So you're looking into a device that looks a lot like a telescope and uh, when you look into the device you can see a circle with two halves and uh, the two halves of the circle are different colours initially and then your job is to uh, turn a dial on the side of the anomaloscope uh, to change the shade of one of the, the halves of colour to bring it um, to try and match the colour of the other half um, as best as you can if that makes sense. So basically the uh, examiner will uh, change the colours of the two halves and then you have to change um, you know, the two halves until they both appear to be the same colour or the, uh, the, the same colour as you perceive it. Um, and the examiner has a, a separate view of what you're doing on the same instrument as well, so they can see how you're adjusting it, um, and they can kind of see how how you're kind of perceiving the color and how closely you're matching the the, the colors of the two halves of the circle. Um, so we did several of those um, kind of more classic tests, and then uh, after that we did the uh, newfangled cat test. So. What I'll do is I'll stop being weird, hiding in the dark here, and I'll show you what the CAD test looks like. So this is a still image from the CAD test, which is a computer-based test developed by extremely clever people at City University in London, with the aim of modernising colour vision testing to improve accuracy of colour vision assessments. The CAD test is a lot more sensitive and much more precise at determining the level of a person's colour vision deficiency. The test itself is controlled by a software program. You'll be sat facing a computer screen which displays images like this. Now you can see that there's a lot of pixelated white noise on the screen and you also have a coloured square within that noise. Now in the actual test, the coloured square will move from one corner of the screen to another and you have to identify which corner the coloured square moves towards by pressing buttons on a keypad controller. The answers are sent to the programme and it will begin automatically changing the colour of the square to determine which colours you're struggling with. As the square moves, the background noise is also animated. Here's a slow motion example of one of the test animations. Each animation of the coloured square's movement will last for about a second and then the program which runs the test will pause, giving you time to submit your answer, so that gives you some control over the pace of the test. Here's an example of what the test is actually like. And if we continue the video, this video is uh, produced by City University themselves and this is an example showing how the colour changes as the test progresses. As the test continues, the program will automatically detect which colours you're having difficulty with and it will narrow down the colour range to test precisely how sensitive you are to those colours. The whole test lasts about 15 to 20 minutes and it's split into two halves so you do get a short break in the middle. Once completed, the program can give the examiner results of the test immediately and the examiner can then translate those results to you. Okay, so that's me just come out of the test. So, long story short, bad news. Um, I won't be able to get a class one medical with the CAA. Um, so I do suffer from something called due to anomaly, which means I've got a red-green colour deficiency. 
more specifically with my uh, ability to detect shades of green um, and after doing the uh, all of the testing um, all of the testing uh, showed a consistent problem with having uh, a green color deficiency so that's good that you know all of the tests were consistent and came up with the same result uh, but the one specifically was the CAD test and that showed that the uh, the kind of error of margin that I have is too big to become or to get a class one medical at least so bad news but uh, funnily enough being back here in London it's kind of taught me be, living and working in London has kind of taught me ways to overcome challenging situations of bad news and things like that you know from being fired from jobs to losing my flat and things like that so immediately my next thought is what what do I need to do next what you know I'm not going to sit here and mope about it um, you know what do I do now is, is always my focus in times like these when I receive bad news so right now so right now right now my focus is I need to get home and I'm meant to be flying out of Gatwick and uh, for those of you watching in the future this happens this is happening on Friday the 21st of December the day after drone apocalypse at Gatwick Airport um, so I've just checked my emails my flight's still going ahead apparently so uh, that should be all right um, but uh, yeah so I'm gonna grab some lunch now make my way out to Gatwick and uh, hopefully fingers crossed the flight's all gonna go ahead I'm gonna get back home on time um, and then once I get back home uh, I'm gonna share the news with my uh, with my family with my boss and uh, we'll figure out what to do it doesn't mean that I can't have a career in aviation um, I could continue working operations for the company I work for um, alternatively I could there is still I think a potential I could still become a flight instructor um, I think I can get a class 2 medical, it, which would limit me to um, VFR in daytime flights only. Um, I think it's just being a class 1 and carrying passengers um, commercially that would be a bit of an issue. But I could still become a ground instructor, I think, with a PPL. Uh, I might still be even, even be able to become a flight instructor. So all is not lost. Um, I don't think I'll ever get to fly in an airline unless the CEA change their uh, tolerance and medical requirements but uh, it's, it's not lost it's uh, something that's there and I just need to figure out how to work with it and work around it so uh, it's not the end of the world don't feel sorry for me um, but uh, yeah I guess through you know through this I can kind of share my experience with with people and uh, for anyone who's passionate about aviation might also have this problem hopefully I can uh, give you some guidance, some information um, and uh, help you, any other aviation enthusiasts, find a way in the aviation industry despite having this uh, colour deficiency issue so uh, I'm going to use this for good, that's what I'm going to do, I'm going to use this for good so anyway, bad news but uh, yeah I'm going to start making my way home now get back to bed, just wrap up wrap myself nice up and warm up my cosy bed which admittedly is in freezing cold Scotland but yeah, you can't win them all, can you? Anyway, uh, yeah, so I'm going to cut the video here, and I guess we're going to have some uh, uh, fancy, what do they call, B-roll footage of me travelling through London, I guess. but uh, it's almost too good to be true. My flight is the only one and everything around it's been delayed, so we'll see how it goes. It says gate info at 16.05, it's now 16.04 and 52 seconds. We got it! 
and this is a dramatic reconstruction of my departure from Gatwick that night. Gatwick Tower, easy 867, ready for taxi. Gatwick Tower calling all stations hold position, all stations hold position. A drone has been sighted over runway 27. Oh, f Station calling, please repeat your last transmission using proper Morse code. Thank you. F off. Roger Wilco. Gatwick Tower calling all stations. Runway 27 has now been reopened. The drone has left the airspace. Oh, quick, quick, go, 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 go. We're leaving. Right, go, go, come on, come on, before it comes back, please. Go, 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 right. Turn here, turn here. Right, okay, straight onto the runway, straight onto the runway. Okay. As soon as we come around, mate, full throttle. Let's go, let's go, let's go. And with that, my little journey to London came to an end. And uh, yeah, damn, damn drones. Literally, we pushed back, we were just about to taxi, and then the airport got closed because uh, the drones came back for a second night, which was... I mean, I I kind of expected it, if I'm going to be honest. Uh, everyone else was really upset about it on the plane, uh, but I kind of expected it. Um, and yeah, I, you know, working in the aviation industry, I kind of knew what to expect, so we were just going to sit there for about an hour, not doing anything, but anyway, it's all in the past now. Um, so yeah, with that, that kind of brings that this video to a close. Hopefully it was a, an interesting video. Uh, I've put a lot of time and effort into it, <laughs> recording it and doing little animations and stuff, so hopefully it was worth watching. Um, yeah, so um, to, to finish off, now that I'm recording this clip a few months down the line, um, knowing that I have that colour deficiency, it might not be as big of a deal as I initially thought, my initial reaction back then. Um, and I'll explain a lot more in future episodes once um, once I cover going and actually getting my um, class two medical license, which you need to be uh, to get a PPL. Um, I'll talk a little more about the color deficiency and how it affects my uh, medical certificates um, in a future video. So it might not be a big a deal as I thought it was. Anyway, uh, I'm gonna wrap up this episode here. Uh, the next video, um, I think uh, I've recorded some clips about beginning some of the theory study, uh, so I'll talk a little bit about some of the theory books that were involved in uh, certainly getting a, a PPL in the UK. Um, so i talk a little bit about that, and in my next video as well I'll talk a little bit about where I work and uh, some of the advantages that that, that uh, workplace gives me. So uh, that's about it. So until the next time, thank you all very much for watching, take care out there and I'll catch you all later.